Thank you, Brett. So if you guys have your Bibles, go ahead and open up with me to John chapter 1. To John chapter 1. I am super grateful for uh, that little hymn there attached at the end. That was really beautiful. Um, All right, so my goal, at least the schedule said that I am supposed to be preaching from verses 14 through 18, but as I studied this week, uh, I couldn't get through verse 14 because I had too much information. So we're going to basically be in verse 14. Um, and if you guys have noticed this, if you've been around church for a few minutes, you, you probably know that on Mother's Day, we are very sweet and kind to moms, right? We give them flowers, and we say we love them, and their goal is that they feel appreciated and cared for. And if you've grown up in church, you know Father's Day isn't like that. <laughs> so normally Father's Day is when men get yelled at, and we're told we're bums, and we just need to, you know, roll your sleeves up and try harder. And so, uh, and if you're wondering why we don't have a gift for the dads, that's my fault, because Brooke asked me if we should do something, and I said, as a dad, I don't really care if I get something on Father's Day, so, uh, sorry, I spoke for all of us, hopefully that's, um, that's okay. Um, but our goal today is to not yell at dads. Our goal today is to talk about our Heavenly Father. And in particular, we want to talk about how God the Father has sent His Son, Jesus, to become a man on our behalf. So look at verse 14. We're going to open up talking about just what theologians call the hypostatic union. Now that's a fancy word that you can find in systematic theology books. But that idea comes from this verse. So the text says that the word became flesh. That Greek word for the word is logos. And if you were Hebrew in the first century one of the people who would have been reading John's gospel, you would have associated certain ideas with that word logos. You would have associated it with creation. And if you remember from last week when Eddie opened up the book, he did a great job of showing us how there is a connection between John 1, 1 through 4 and the beginning of creation, Genesis 1 and 2. That just in the beginning God created everything, and in the beginning the Word was with God and was God. And so there's this correlation with creation itself, and that Jesus existed prior to that creation. In addition to that, that word logos in the Old Testament, when the Septuagint was translated, was directly tied to the wisdom of God. And so the logos was the idea that wisdom personified, that it manifested itself through the person of Christ. D.A. Carson said it best. He said, God simply speaks and his powerful word creates. So that word logos carries all kinds of like realities for the original audience of this text. Then the scripture goes on to say, and the word became flesh. The technical name for that is that it's the incarnation of God. The incarnation of God is that God took on flesh and he became a man. Y'all, I read a commentary from one of the leading scholars on the Gospel of John, a guy by the name of Andreas Kostenberger. And Kostenberger says this. He says, there is a Greek word that means body, and there is a Greek word that means man. But when John translates how Jesus became a person, a man, he doesn't use the word body, and he doesn't use the word man. He uses a word that we would translate as flesh. And he uses that word very, very intentionally, according to Kostenberger. Here's why. He says that word flesh carries the idea of all of your humanity that exists outside of God. That the idea of flesh was normally viewed as something negative. It was something that revealed that you were inferior to God. And when the text says that God took on flesh, it implies that he's humbled himself. That he's become a man in a way that allows him to be amongst you and I. Kostenberger goes on to say that the powerful word of God has been born into frail humanity. And the doctrine of the incarnation would have been a radical idea to the vast majority of people within the first century. If you grew up Greek, you would think about the logos as this essence of truth and knowledge. And why would God ever leave there? Like, according to Greek mythology and Roman gods, they might manifest themselves temporarily as a man, but they would never actually become a human being. That would be crazy. And other people would view the idea of God becoming a man as just complete heresy. 
I mean, he's God. Why would God ever lower himself to be somebody messy like you and I? And the text is clear. Jesus did not manifest himself as a human. He didn't appear like a human. No, Jesus became a man. He was fully God and fully man. That's what that word means, hypostatic union. And I learned this in seminary, so all the math people can get annoyed with this. But Jesus is 100% God, and he's also 100% man. And you may say that's really bad math, and it is, but it's great theology. He's both of those things at the same time. And y'all know I like church history, so hopefully if you don't like history, this won't bore you, this next section. There were two bishops in the third and the fourth century by the name of Athanasius and Arius. And they opposed one another on this topic of Jesus being God. So Arius was a bishop who made this argument that the vast majority of, I would argue, people in America believe today. Arius argued that Jesus was a special and an important person but he was not fully God. And as a consequence, Jesus was not equal to the Father. Arius argued that Jesus couldn't be God, because if he was God, that would somehow diminish the beauty and the majesty of the Father. He goes on to claim that since Jesus wasn't equal to the Father, then that must mean that Jesus was created at some point in creation itself. And what that produced was, is Arius and all of the people who began to believe his teachings said that we'll respect Jesus, and we'll even revere Jesus, but we will never claim that he's God, and we certainly wouldn't claim he's equal to the Father. And so what that produced was, was a heresy, and that heresy permeated the church. And Arius' teachings, it went so far across uh, the religious world, the Christian world at that time, that somebody had to oppose it. And that's where a guy named Athanasius pops up. This guy, Athanasius, completely rejected the teachings of Arius. And by the way, Arius was the first, one of the first people who actually made this, this argument about the deity of Jesus. And Athanasius writes a really small book. It's called On the Incarnation. You can read, you can read it in like 15, 20 minutes. It's super short. And in this book, he, he has all of these arguments where he essentially debunks the arguments of Arius. Now, here's my point. Athanasius will spend the rest of his life fighting and arguing with Arius and all of his followers. By the end of Athanasius' life, he's exiled from his home five different times. See, because Athanasius believed that Jesus was God. And that belief cost him something. Nathan Finn, a scholar from the seminary I attended, he says that it's highly likely that Athanasius probably died without ever really knowing if his, uh, his arguments in favor of the godness of Jesus won the day. So he died not even knowing that he won. And by the way, he did win. And many of us today are born again Christians believing that Jesus is God. And the point is this. Here's the whole point of this, okay? Athanasius' sacrifice is not unique to him. Most of the early church, particularly the apostles and the disciples of Christ, they died. They were martyrs for their belief that Jesus was God. And even Jesus himself was crucified on a cross Because he claimed he was more than a man. He claimed that he was God. He says this to a group of religious leaders in John chapter 8. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So the people around him picked up stones to stone him to death. See, Jesus' claim was not that he was just a normal person like you and I. Jesus proclaimed that if you saw the Father, you saw him. Jesus believed fully that he was God, and he taught that openly. So when you say you believe Jesus is God, then church history and the scriptures themselves teach us that it will cost you something. In particular, when you and I live in a world that utterly reject the notion and the idea that Jesus is fully God. And newsflash, 
That's what people believe in America. Jesus is cool, he's A-OK, but don't tell me he's God. So I want to apply this to a particular group of people within our congregation. I want to apply this to any teenager that is here today. So maybe you're here and you go to a private school, or maybe even you're homeschooled, or maybe you go to, most of our students go to Palaka Junior Senior High School, which I, I still don't like calling it that, but I get that's what it is, <laughs> or, or Interlochen Junior Senior High School. And, and maybe you're here right now. And you know something about the school you attend. You know that your belief that Jesus is God is going to cost you something in that place. You know that it's probably not popular or cool to live your life in a way that's surrendered to Christ. My guess would be that most of you may feel hard-pressed to name more than five born-again Christians. You may can name five people that you go to school with who check that box but you don't really know anybody that actually lives that out faithfully in all the areas of their life, or they try to at least. So as a result, this pressure in your life, you kind of feel as if, if I follow and obey Jesus, you will look weird and strange to your peers. You may feel like if I prioritize going to church over the sport I play, or over your academics, or over the extracurricular activities you're a part of, you may feel like if you devote your body and your eyes to remaining sexually pure, you may feel like when you seek to share Christ with people who need him, that that's going to hurt those relationships. And people are going to look at you as if you're some kind of like overly preachy person. And you know that your belief in Christ is going to cost you. And it could cost you social status, popularity, or maybe even it will cost you having fun because you're young. And the way that you feel this temptation is to respond to that pressure in a way that you compromise your faith and you conform to the ways of this world. And maybe you're tempted to lay aside your belief that Jesus is king and to live like everybody else. Or maybe you're like how I was in high school, that you'll have a plan. Because you believe Jesus is God, so for this season of your life, you're only young once. So you'll just kind of put your faith in Jesus under a, like a tent. And one day when you get old, you'll come back to Jesus and serve him. Because you know outright rebellion wouldn't be acceptable, so you've got a plan to kind of sidestep it and justify it. And it is true, a lot of people, even in our church, like wandered away from the Lord for high school, college, and 20s, and they have come back, but a lot of people don't come back to the church. And see, when you live your life in a way that would lead you to look strange to your peers and a social outcast, you gotta ask this question, why would you do that? Why would you openly live your life in a way that makes you look strange to the people around you? Well, let me tell you why you would do that. Because you really believe Jesus is God. And you believe that with all of your heart. And let me say this clearly to the teenagers in the room. Your parents believe that Jesus is God and your grandparents believe Jesus is God don't count for you. You have to believe this for yourself. And the reason you would do it is because it's true. And you believe these things because following Jesus is worth losing everything for. And if it will cost you, your response to that is Jesus is worth it. He's worthy of everything. So to all the teenagers in our room, do you believe Jesus is God? Do you believe he took on flesh and dwelt amongst us? Do you have an intimate relationship with him? And if you do, what is that costing you? But the text goes on and gives us even more richer things for us to study. The text goes on to say that the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. That word literally means he tabernacled with us. Y'all, I've got a, a picture that I, I want to show you. This is a picture of the Old Testament teaching of the tabernacle. Not a teaching, but an actual thing in the Old Testament. And if you've ever studied the Old Testament, there's this narrative in Exodus where the people of God are in Egypt and God says, let my people go. And through some coercion and sovereignty of God, Pharaoh finally does that. And then you have this season in the life of the nation of Israel where they're wandering the wilderness because of their rebellion. During that season of 40 years while they're wandering, they needed a place of worship. They needed a house of God. And that house of God, during that season of wandering around until they built the temple in Solomon's time, uh, I mean, it went for multiple times, even to the monarchies, the, the, that wandering time, the place of worship was called the tabernacle. The tabernacle had to be mobile during that season because they moved so much. And in that, that tabernacle, it contained something called the Holy of Holies. 
that in the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant, and the idea of that room was it, it revealed or it showed them the presence of God himself. Which is why nobody could go into the Holy of Holies except for the high priest. And the high priest could only go in there like one time in the year to offer this sacrifice on the Day of Atonement for all of the people of God. And that tabernacle represented like an expression of worship where the nation of Israel would bring animals and they would bring grain and they would bring offerings and sacrifices before God. And as an expression of faith, they believed that if I brought these things to the Lord and the priestly order would intercede for us, that God would save us from our sins. The coolest thing about the tabernacle you can see is it's in the center of all of the tribes. See, there's 12 tribes of Israel, and God's design, his law was, when you pitch that tent, make sure all the tribes are all the way around us. And there's uh, multiple times throughout this time frame that the Bible says something called the Shekinah glory would shine down on the Holy of Holies. The Shekinah glory was the manifestation of the presence and the glory of God on the earth. Even so much so that it was like you couldn't even see the face of God in that time or you would die. That's how powerful the presence and the glory of God was. So you've got to realize when John is choosing to help his readers understand the manifestation of Christ in the incarnation, he uses that illustration. That God left the glory and splendor of heaven to come to this earth to tabernacle amongst, amongst us to be around us and in the presence of sinful people who desperately need his grace and his mercy. And the text goes on to say that this he came for he tabernacled for a purpose. He came for the glory as of the only son from the father. That word glory is doxa. That word means to glorify, honor or hold in renown. The Old Testament understanding of glory meant heavy, weightiness. Which means the idea is, is that if you could actually be in the presence of the glory of God, what you do is you fall on your face. Because you recognize quickly he's God and you're not. You recognize he's infinite and you're finite. He knows everything and you really don't know anything at all. And so the idea of heaviness is there's this weightiness when you're in the presence of the king of kings. And the creator of all things. And so Jesus' glory, at least according to this text and really all of Scripture, is ultimately about the glory of the Father. Because Jesus and the Father are one. Jesus said this explicitly, when you have seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. John 14, 9 says it like this. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still don't know, know me, Philip? For whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? So Jesus is correcting them because they asked him, when are we finally going to get to see the Father? And Jesus is like, look, if you've seen me, it's just as good as seeing the Father. So one of the major missions for Jesus was to live his perfect, holy life, die on a cross, and rise from the dead in order that the Father might be magnified and glorified. And the greatest manifestation of Jesus' work to glorify his Father is in the cross. See, the physical body of Jesus is important to you and I as Christians. Because if you ever thought about this, how could God die? Better yet, how could God allow people to punch him in the face, or to be whipped, or to be cut, or to bleed, or to have flesh ripped off of his bones? The only way that that could happen to a supernatural God is if that God put on human form. And when Jesus did this, he went to the cross and he died the death that you and I as sinful people have earned. And he died as a substitute for your sin and my sin. He died as a sacrifice in order that we might have what we need the most, which is forgiveness of sins. And Isaiah 53.10 says it like this. It was the will of the Father to crush him. Meaning that when Jesus died the horrific death that he died on the cross, that is exactly what God wanted. Because God knew the only way to save sinners like you and I is not through good works or church attendance or being religious. The only hope that you and I have is if somebody comes and dies in our place. And the cross is this beautiful picture in the history of the world 
where Jesus did that. And Jesus' journey to the cross was all about his glory. And I want to say this with grace, but directness and truthfulness. That means that the death of Jesus was about his glory, not yours. It means he died in order that he might be exalted. Look, he loves you, and he did die for you in a personal way. But he did that so that the fame of his name would spread to the ends of the earth. Not the fame of my name or your name. And one day Jesus is going to experience ultimate glorification at the end of time. I mean, we'll get to experience ultimate glorification at the end of time. But when Christ rose from the dead, there's a picture of him in all of his glory and his splendor. And notice again in the text that not only does he live for the glory of the Father, but Jesus' glory is unique. The text says he's the only son from the Father. He's a one-of-a-kind son in the original language. Kostenberger, the theologian, says that there's a reference here to the time of Abraham, when Abraham took his one-of-a-kind son, Isaac, and laid him on the altar. There's a correlation between that passage and this one. All John is doing is he's just making another argument that's in harmony with what Eddie shared last week, that these things have been written in order that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Messiah. So I want to make just a big application for all of our hearts today. Uh, We made it earlier, but I think it's worth saying in another way is this. Y'all, here's what this means. This means Jesus is God. And I don't want to insult any of our intelligence. You guys realize I'm like a Palaka person, right? Like, I, I, this is my home. I think like a Palaka person. I have my whole life. And people used to make fun of me in other towns that I live. But I do. I'm a Palaka person. And here's my guess about you if you're kind of a Palaka button County person. My guess is your struggle with the truth that Jesus is God is not a technical one. That's my guess. Maybe some of you are super smart, and there's some of you that it might be that. But most of us, the struggle about Jesus being God is not a technical one in the sense everybody's got PhDs and doctorates, and we want to dig into Greek words and church history and when this became and osmosis and all Like, most people don't think like that in our community. That's my guess. Most people, the struggle with Jesus as God is not a technical one, it's a practical one. What I mean by that is, is that we kind of live in a culture and a society in our community that when surveyed what do you believe about eternity in heaven what's your religion that people will check that box of christian and even people who would check that box of being a christian if you say jesus is god they'll check that box or maybe people in our community a lot most people in our community when they're asked that question they'll say i believe jesus is god but i'm not i'm none i'm like no organized religion because i've gotten burned in a church before And so even though people might check that box, here's the challenge for many of us. There's no evidence that we outwardly actually believe that Jesus is God. So the struggle that we have with Jesus being who he is, it's not some technical, theological, academic conversation. It's that we struggle living our life in a way that displays evidence that we believe with all of our hearts that Jesus is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And y'all, I hate how tribal everything is in America. In many ways, our tribalism is dividing our country down the line, and I hope I'm not sounding tribal when I say what I'm about to say. But you just need to hear that according to the Scriptures, you must pick a side. Either Jesus is God or he is not God. He cannot be God both logically speaking it would contradict itself would you agree with that it's inconsistent to say jesus is awesome and wonderful i'm going to revere him and respect him but every single thing he said about him being god is not true it doesn't make any sense for us to think like that but that's the common view of many people and maybe even that might be the common view of you so you and i don't get the freedom to claim jesus as god and then create our own list of rules and religious activities. If Jesus is God, then that means every single thing he said is true. And we ought to follow him and obey him. It means you cannot be on the fence about who Jesus is. One pastor I really like a lot, J.D. Greer, here's what he says. He says, if you only come to Jesus because you want or need advice in a time of need, And then after you get the thing that you want, you either reject it or follow it, 
You never worry about the words of Christ again. Greer says, that reveals Jesus is your advisor, not your God. And if I could give you an example of this, some guys and I, we went to the Southern Baptist Convention this last week. And my favorite part of the convention was the International Mission Board brought missionaries onto the stage. And they had like 90 seconds to share briefly their story and what God was calling them to. And me and the guys that I was with, we just sat there overwhelmed with emotion. Many of them had to stand behind a screen because they couldn't tell you where they were going because it's a closed country that's hostile to the gospel. And we sat and we watched single men and women say, I'm going to another country. And my parents don't understand. Would you pray for me? We sat and listened to like people my age who say, I've got three, I've got four kids. They're little. Life is chaotic. But God's calling us to go. Would you pray for my kids and us as we learn language and live into another country? But the one that got me where I just was overwhelmed with emotion was there was a, an older couple and they say, God's calling us to this region of the world that we can't tell you. And we have three adult kids and six or seven grandkids. And they don't understand why we're going. And every single one of those people on that stage, you know what their logic was for going to the nations? Because they believe that Jesus is God and the nations deserve to hear about this Jesus. And you've got to ask a question. Why in the world, if you as a parent of small kids would put your family in like danger's way like that and why would a grandparent leave their grandkids the only reason you would do that is if you really did believe that jesus was god and his gospel his like glory should extend to the ends of the earth and please do not misunderstand this like applicant this, this point i am not suggesting that if you believe jesus is god it's mandatory for you to leave your family and go to the nations i'm saying if you really do believe jesus is god you would do that if god told you to do that Because you would say he is infinitely more valuable than anything in this world. Even family. Even money. Even that house you love and the car you drive and the truck you drive. Because he is that incredible savior for you and I. And hear me, this is why this is good news. Because we believe his glory is rooted in his rescuing of our souls. That Christ came to save us. Now, I have an analogy. All analogies break down. You can poke holes in it if you want, and I'll be insecure about my analogy. Um, okay, so check this out. Here's kind of how I, I was thinking about how people sometimes misunderstand, like, Jesus being God and what he calls us to. I want you to imagine there's a 19-year-old kid. I know they're not kids. They're adults. They can vote, be in the military. I get that. But let's just say they're 19, and they're still kind of like kid. And this 19-year-old has a really stupid plan. They're going to travel the country. That's not a dumb plan. But what's dumb is they don't have any plan. They don't make a budget. They don't know where they're going to sleep. They, don't, they just know there's a couple sites they want to go see. And this 19-year-old gets in their vehicle, and they just begin to drive. They get five, six states away, and because they're careless, they don't check the oil, they don't take tire pressure, they don't do all the things that responsible people do, and after they get five or six states away from, from you and here in Florida, their car breaks down, and they're stranded on the side of the road. Because they were careless, and they didn't have a plan, and they were dumb, They've run out of money. They don't know how to fix their vehicle. They can't get it towed. They can't get it to the mechanic. They can't stay in a hotel. They are finished. They're done. So that 19-year-old does what any self-respecting 19-year-old do. They call their dad. And that dad hears the voice of his kid. And in the middle of the night, he gets into the vehicle and he drives five states away. Let's just say it takes him 24 hours to get there. That dad drives the whole time to rescue his kid. Then that dad gets to where their kid is. That dad takes his own money, even though they were stupid. Part of me is like, bro, you made this bed, you've got to sleep in it. You know, some of y'all got that parenting style. But, it's like, but the dad gets there. The dad takes his own money, gets it towed. The dad takes his own money, his family's own money, gets it sent to the mechanic, pays the mechanic to fix it. And then the dad pays his own money to put them in a hotel. And here's what I want you to imagine with me, okay? While they're staying in the hotel, the dad says, I've never been in this part of the country. And I've heard their barbecue's the best in the country. And over there is a restaurant I saw on diners, dive-ins, and dives. And I'd really like to go eat there. What if the 19-year-old goes, I don't want to do that. I'd rather eat Tex-Mex. Now hear me out. 
If our dads drove all of that way and paid thousands of dollars to help us, guess what? They get to pick where we eat dinner. Amen? And when you believe that Jesus left heaven to come to this earth to save you from your sins, you do not get to go to that Jesus and say, now you get to be however I want you to be, Jesus. We go to Jesus and we say, you are God. And apart from you, I'm nothing. And I bow low before you. And you want me to honor you with my body, I'll honor you with my body. You want me to honor you with my words, I'll honor you with my words. You want me to honor you with my money, I'll honor you with my money. You want me to honor you with my time, I'll do it. Because you have saved me. You, Lord, get to pick where we eat dinner. And anybody that denies that is just selfish and ungrateful. Or they don't actually believe and see the sacrifice that Christ made for us. But the text gets got more stuff for us. So not only did Christ come and tabernacle amongst us for his glory, but the text says that he came in grace and truth. See, God's glory is rooted in his character. And God's got all kinds of characteristics and attributes, but at least here in this passage, it highlights his grace and his truthfulness. Yo, that word grace is charis. That's where we get our word charity from. Don't misunderstand the word charity. Don't think, you know, a person ringing the bell outside of Publix around December. It's more than that. The idea of grace is God's kindness towards sinner, sinners. The Apostle Paul in the epistles, in the other parts of the New Testament, when he uses this word grace, he means unmerited favor. That simply means that God shows you kindness. He shows you favor. Even though there's nothing in your life that would be worthy of that favor. That's what grace is. He gives you something that you don't deserve. But then Jesus also came in truth. In other words, aletheia, it means truth or true in fact, worthy of credit. Simply put, it means the words of Christ can be trusted and will always be in harmony with what's true and right. And we'll study this in more details in like a month when we get to John 4. But when you begin to read the Gospel of John, what you can see throughout the Gospel of John threaded in is Jesus displays grace and truth. Truth and grace. The example I just want to highlight, 10,000 feet, we'll dig into it in more detail down the road, is John 4. Jesus goes to this well and he interacts with this woman from Samaria. And as he's interacting with this woman from Samaria, she's, it's like ethnically and racially she's not really hebrew she's not really greek she's kind of like in between as a result everybody hates the samaritans but jesus shows her grace by talking to her jesus showed grace to her by talking to a woman because most rabbis would have never had anything to do with women jesus shows her grace by preaching the good news of his love and grace towards her she's drinking water and jesus says i got some water if you drink you never thirst again and she thinks he's talking about physical water, but Jesus is talking about eternal life. And then later on, Jesus says, why don't you bring your husband to us? This is the truthful part. And she says, answers it in some kind of shady way, and Jesus says this. For you have had five husbands, and the one you are with now is not your husband. And so you find these things in tension, where Jesus is being truthful, and he's calling her out for the sin in her life. And yet he's showing her grace by saying, if you'll trust me, I can make all things right. I can forgive you of any sin or any mistake that you've ever made. And the Samaritan woman in that moment trusts Jesus with her life. You know what she does directly after that? She goes around and tells everybody that she's met God in the flesh and his name is Jesus. And so we see this beautiful example that God comes with grace and mercy, but he also proclaims the truth. So he doesn't rub her face in her failures. He says it's wrong. And he offers her redemption if she would trust him. All right, so here's kind of how I want to close out at least the, the final point of application. I do want to speak to the dads, and hopefully I'm not going to yell at you. I'm just kidding. I don't have to hope. I'm not going to. Uh, I want to just say a quick word to the dad, even to the, men's in the, room, the men in the room. If you don't have kids and you're a man, I think that this certainly would still apply to you. But if you're here and you're a dad, I just want to say the most important thing that you'll accomplish in your life is that you devote your life of displaying the grace and the truth of Jesus. I understand that that's the calling for every Christian, including women, okay? So humor me. 
Every believer on the planet, men and women, young and old, this is the calling to display the grace and truth of God, but it's Father's Day. And if I, as a man, I sometimes feel like there are these things competing for my identity. I have this like unique temptation sometimes. No, it's not unique. This common temptation where I think who I am and the most important thing about me is something else besides Christ and living for his glory. So here's some things that compete in my heart sometimes. Sometimes us as men, we're tempted to believe that our past accomplishments or accolades is where our identity is. Or we believe the lie that's the most important thing about us. And maybe it's not in the past, maybe it's in the future, and we kind of have this idea that when you think about me, you'll think of everything that I've accomplished. Uh, the, a funny joke with that is, is like my dad, um, well, by the way, I got his permission to say this joke, so don't think I'm being mean. So the rumor is that my dad, when he was in high school and college, was an awesome athlete. Uh, he was in dunk contest in South Florida. He played college basketball. He was like really great at basketball and I guess football, I guess. Um, I'm just kidding. And so the joke is in our family when we were teenagers and Brian and Mikey and I were like really athletic, involved in sports, he would talk about his heyday and we would just be like, Dad, we don't care. <laughs> and look, we're joking. It's kind of how homes are. It's like we just kind of talk trash. Um, and we were being mean and disrespectful, so that's not right. But, but I think what is true, what is true, is it really doesn't matter in the scheme of life. James Dobson, a pastor, a, 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 a guy that has a really cool ministry he did back in the 90s, I read a book from him one time, and he said he played tennis in college, and he climbed in the attic, and he saw all of his trophies from when he played college, the college sport he played. And then he thought, these have sat up here for like 20 years, and nobody even knows they're here. I heard another pastor I like in Clearwater, he said that, he said, maybe you're really like excited about how good your grades were in high school, but it's really weird if you approach any conversation when you're grown with saying, you know what my GPA was when I was in high school? And I'm not saying it's unimportant, okay? Like, praise the Lord, my dad could dunk in high school. Huh? At least one helms could. But like, but I am saying that in the scheme of life, it really doesn't matter. You know why it doesn't matter? Here's why. Because if you live your life for that, guess what every generation is after you doing? They're living their life to have accolades and accomplishments that would bypass you. And when we say that's the purpose for existing, it's in the words of Solomon and Ecclesiastes, just chasing after the wind. Or maybe you're here as a man, and I'm kind of in this category too. You feel like your identity is in how much you've accomplished in your job or how much money you make. And look, there's nothing wrong with us as men identifying with our jobs, because every one of us do it. If I said, like, let's all go around and say your name and a little bit about yourself, 90% of the men in the room would say their occupation, because we identify with being providers and taking care of those around us, and that's good, right? The Bible says if you don't provide for your family, you're worse than an unbeliever, so we're not throwing shade at that. But the problem resides when you say you believe the lie that your value as a man is rooted in how much money you bring home, or how important you are at your job. The point is this. Your life only matters if you live for something that will last for eternity. And when you and I live to display the grace and the truth of Jesus, then the impact that we have will go on for generations. Either in our family or in the body of Christ. And you know how I know that? Because my father taught me like that. And you know, there were times that when I was in high school, my parents didn't have a ton of money. And I didn't get a brand new glove, and I had to borrow the rich kid's baseball bat when I was on the baseball team, you know what I'm saying? Like, like there wasn't a flood of money or status and success from my parents. But I had a dad that would sit us down when we wanted to play Halo 2, and he made us have family devotions. And I had a dad who would sit and he would teach me about the grace of Jesus and the truth of Jesus. And I'm 39. Guess what I cherish at 39 years old from my dad? How much, what is, you think I even know what his salary was when I was 15? Or what he did in high school? Do you know what I cherish? I cherish the fact that he invested in me and he taught me who Jesus is. And one day we are going to die, man. And people will stand 
behind an altar like this, and they will testify to your life. And on that day, nobody will say, that joker got to six digits, salary-wise. They won't say, you know, you should have seen them in high school. You know, they were on really good sports teams. They'll say, he impacted my life for eternity. So as James and them come up, Look, my mom impacted me too. I don't want to throw shade at my mom. She was a big part of that also. And my dad learned that from his dad. And my prayer is one day I'll get to pass that down to my family. So just last thought. For all of us in this room, men and women, the most important thing about you is your belief that Jesus is God. Doesn't matter how much money you make, doesn't matter what your social status is, doesn't matter if you're able to buy your kids every single thing that they want. If you want your life to be a success, then teach your kids about the grace and truth of Christ. And don't get distracted by the thing that the world is offering. So here's how I want us to close. This is uh, gonna work, I'm thinking. Um, I want us collectively, in the next few minutes, to pray for all the dad and the men in the room. And if you don't have kids and you're single, I just want to say to you, who you are as a single man is probably who you're going to be as a married man. And who you are as a married man with no kids is who you're going to be as a dad. God can change people, I get that. But if you don't have discipline now, you're not going to have it when you have kids. And so what I want to ask everybody in the room, men and women to do, if you are able to try to get on your knees wherever you are. I understand the aisles are, you may have to space out a little bit. Maybe you gotta get into the, the aisles all over the place. But my, what I'm prayerfully thinking is, as we get on our knees, we're posturing ourselves in a way of lowliness before God. We're outwardly expressing that He's God and we're not. And I want us to play, pray collectively together on our knees before God. And when I say amen, we'll have a chance to stand and we'll get to sing what you guys have heard me say. This is probably one of my favorite songs in Christ alone. But we can just celebrate who he is. So I'm going to ask you to get on your knees right now. If you can't, don't worry. You know what? This isn't like you get brownie points for it. But if you'll get on your knees, and I want us to close out in a word of prayer right now. If you've got to spread out, spread out.